Welcome back to the afternoon session of Global Webit Congress, Leaders of the Future Tech Summit. We'll be continuing with our Capital Talk stream. And our first speaker is currently on the board of Sunstone Capital, focusing on internet, mobile, and software investments. His personal investments include a UK-based Last FM, which sold to CBS for $280 million in an all-cash deal. Born in Hamburg and has lived in Germany, Canada, the UK, France, India, and the US, Max Niederhofer came to Istanbul to be our next speaker. Let's give him a warm welcome. Hi. It's the, uh, it's the post-lunch session, which is always a bit challenging, and your ranks are light. Um, that's fine. If you. Uh, Think back to history, you know, Jesus started with 12 disciples. I think we're doing pretty well. I think Muhammad started with about 100, but he, uh, he conquered many more territories. Um, I, am, I have a bit of a challenge because I'm trying to use my phone for notes and I have a handheld microphone, so I'm gonna have to change the slides in a bit of an awkward fashion. But you know what, that's not bad because it gives us a bit of more time to think about the things that uh, I can say. I'm actually starting off with the same picture as um, Tony Conrad yesterday, which is quite funny because this is from a Great blog that does free stock photography. Very briefly, a bit of street cred. I started out in this industry in 1997, building my first web page um, for a client. I was uh, just out of high school. It was the exciting days of the internet. It held a lot of promise. Um, today, it feels very different. Um, I then went on to uh, found Germany's largest blogging community. I was a big believer in uh, communication software. Um, did okay from that, made a bit of money, um, and then uh, started out as an angel, invested in a few companies, the first one of which was Last.fm, which was very successful. Um, and I discovered that I had a passion for helping other entrepreneurs succeed. I found it intellectually more challenging. Um, I, uh, I love backing young people with, with great ideas. And so I pursued a career in venture capital. Um, I joined a firm called Atlas first, then uh, Another firm called Axel Partners, who are investors, first investors in Facebook and Rovio and Spotify, many other com companies. Um, and now finally I'm running my own firm called Sunstone Capital, um, based out of Copenhagen in Denmark. We're four guys, we're not very big, $110 million, and we back early stage companies across Europe, um, and hopefully in the next step in, uh, in Turkey as well, in the next fund. I don't want to talk to you today as a venture capitalist. The, the issue that I have going to these conferences is that I'm a walking cash machine. Um, you know, I, I kind of stand there and all the entrepreneurs come up to me and they say, you know what, here's my company, here's my idea, can we get a bit of, bit of money for this? And it's, you know, in 99% of the cases it's heartbreaking because these are all good people with interesting ideas pursuing oftentimes businesses that are not very good businesses, and, um, at least from our perspective. And, um, and that's very difficult. It also screws with your personality because you think you're very popular when in fact you're not popular at all, it's your money that's popular. And so there's a, there's a very interesting trend is that you know, a lot of venture capitalists are perceived as these you know, assholes, but that's because everyone always comes up to them and asks them for money and, and they think it's because of their winning personality and it's, it's not that case at all. Um, I wanna talk to you today about something that's very close to my heart. Um, so I want you to imagine away the clothes that I'm wearing, you know, the clothes to some extent of modern Western imperialism, you know, the blazer and the denim and, and all that stuff. And think of me more as, as a revolutionary that is trying to make change happen in this world in a very different way, even to what we're discussing at this conference. So this is a quote from Mark Andreessen. It is an interesting quote in the sense that it, it has very many implications for today's world. Um, what he means is that the ubiquity of software is changing every industry we know. The rise of the algorithm is going to impact all parts of our lives, not just communication with our loved ones, but our relationship with governments, with companies, with every industry that we could possibly perceive working in. But the rise of the algorithm is not a uniformly good thing. You know, for the tech industry, it'll be great. It's going to create a lot of jobs. It's going to make some of us very wealthy which is wonderful. But originally when I started out working on the internet, the great promise of this new system, of this new protocol of communication was that it levels the playing field. The barriers to entry into building something important were suddenly no longer the leading 
minds of certain countries or the politicians or the ruling families or the large businesses. Suddenly, everyone could go out and build a web page and put a message out in the world. And it's not going to take, you know, 2,000 years for it to become pervasive, right? The large social movements like Islam and Christianity and capitalism and democracy, you know, they took thousands of years to take root in humanity. And with the internet, we had the promise that suddenly we could build things within a short space of several years or several decades. Software is eating the world has unfortunately turned around and become something very different. When I was eight years old, my mother, I don't know, wanting to progress me more quickly, gave me a book to read, 1984, from George Orwell. And today we live, funnily enough, in a world that resembles 1984. Software eating the world also means that the algorithms have been turned against us. We have Edward Snowden. You know, think of him what you will. Is he a traitor? Is he a hero? In the end, all we know is that that great invention of the internet that was built for humanity and was supposed to be a force of good has been turned against us. Now, you can be a fan of your government or not a fan of your government, but the issue is if someone is listening to every single piece of communication that you do, you're going to behave very differently. So that is 1984. There's another wonderful book by a chap called Aldous Huxley, which many of you may have read. It's called Brave New World. And the vision of the dystopia of the future was very different. It wasn't 1984. Everyone is monitoring all your communications. The vision was we, as a people, are going to be living in stupor. We're going to be lost in a world of entertainment. And we're living in that exact world today. And to some extent, it's called Netflix. But to a large extent, it's probably called Facebook. right? Not only are we constantly entertained, constantly trying to get that endorphin hit of a social connection, but we're also connecting with something that is not true about humanity. We're connecting with the things that people want to show us, want to make us believe that they're true. And um, that's fairly scary. So software is eating the world it actually is something that points to the current crisis that we're in. And it is an interesting crisis. In 1990, a historian called Francis Fukuyama, again, many of you may have read this article, said, it is the end of history. Capitalism and democracy has won. You know, a short 25 years on, we look around the world, especially in Turkey, and we realize that is not the case at all. If anything, the new old volatility is back. In Turkey, we have Islamic State at the borders. We're suddenly allied with you know, a uh, political movement that previously we thought of as a, as a terrorist movement, the PKK. And now we're using them to fight, you know, more evil. And it just begs the question of what, what do we as technology entrepreneurs, what can we really do in this kind of world? I had a few pictures here and, you know, the conference organizers asked me to change them because they were much more dramatic pictures. They were the bodies of Palestinian children being carried through the streets of Gaza. They were air attacks in Raqqa and Syria where many innocent civilians have died. And there are pictures like this that outline, to some extent, what is wrong with the world today and something that we've completely lost sight of as an industry. We have Islamic State, we have Ukraine, we have Gaza. Sure, these are large political crises. And then we have a, a French guy, Thomas Piketty, who wrote a book about the inbuilt inequality of capitalism. And if you see a picture like that, you, do, you should ask yourself, you know, what is technology actually doing for a person like that in India, you know, who, lives, who sleeps in the streets with her young child? Um, we have inequality. We have overpopulation. We have climate change, depending on whether or not you believe in it, you know, is a bit of a question. But we have all these large crises in the world. And Early on, actually, uh, when I was studying economics, I studied something called the Club of Rome. And the Club of Rome in the 1950s projected overpopulation, us running out of resources, peak oil, and uh, a great dying in humanity because we're, we're not going to be able to sustain ourselves. Now, what the Club of Rome got wrong was one thing, technological progress. So their whole equation that they'd used to calculate this horrible future for us got one thing wrong, technological progress. Because in the meantime, we have gotten much more efficient at using oil. We've gotten much more efficient at building cities. We've gotten much better at feeding the population. So to some extent, 
we're at a very similar point today where we're facing huge problems. And the one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk is the solution is technological progress for all these things. I mean, these girls, they have absolutely no purpose in life. She's already on Facebook again trying to communicate with, like, Whoa, what, next, what party are we going to go to next, right? These are two Chinese consumers sleeping in the resting room of an IKEA because you know what the Chinese consumer must consume because otherwise China will grind to a halt. You know, as tech entrepreneurs, I'm sure there's something we can do about that. Migrants in North America. So I walk around the startup booths here, and it is not a criticism of many of you. It is completely natural to look at the world and say, you know, what is the market opportunity, and let me fulfill the market opportunity. But this is the type of company I see, and it really pisses me off. You know, it is a company oriented at relatively well-to-do consumers, incremental innovation. Let's not take too much risks. A company like that is never going to change the world. It might change the world for pet grooming services in a very local area, but you know what? It's not particularly interesting. So the question that I want to ask you today is, what is your purpose? Why are you doing what you're doing? I've invested in two kinds of founders. One of them I would call mercenary founders. You know, great business background, some Goldman, some McKinsey, very, very smart guys. You know, they're primarily out there, primarily out there to make money. And those are, they're good entrepreneurs. They execute well, they run very efficient businesses, but in the end, they're mercenary. They do it for the money. And I really want to implore you to think about becoming a missionary founder, to becoming something that has a, a higher purpose in life. And if I, if I should leave you with one thing, because I see I'm running out of time, I tend to ramble with these things when I care. Software is inherently political. There's no such thing as a neutral algorithm. You always have one view of the world, and the way you build your software, every line of code, right, means something. If it's closed source, it could be exploited. If it's open source, it could be that it's more difficult to use for consumers and that you must make it easier. But software is a political statement. It is communication. This guy's a high-frequency trader. You know, one of the smartest minds of our generation is optimizing how quickly I can trade commodities. It is so far removed from the human experience that I'm a capitalist, I'm a libertarian at heart, but this bugs me. Entrepreneurship is one of the last great adventures that we have left. The world has discovered, you know, I'm all with Elon Musk, like, let's populate other planets, but to some extent, we need to change how we live our lives, and I think technology can be a fundamental part of that. And I'd like you to, I'd like you to think bigger. I think the biggest problem we have with, with humanity today is that we do not see the humanity, or depending on what your religious views are, as the divinity in the other person. And that failure is a lack of bandwidth in communication between people. If we would truly understand the other person, there is no way we would ever resort to violence. And because of that, it is really up to us to make communication protocols better to let people express their humanity and to let other people see that humanity and understand them, the different cultures, the different beliefs. And those are the great companies that are being built. Facebook fundamentally is a phenomenal idea. It's great. The world should be more open and connected. The way they've implemented it in an ad finance model, unfortunately, has tended to turn out the wrong way. Twitter is probably a much better example of a mission-driven company that is actually changing the world for the better. And so if you have not yet started out building a company, do think about the good that you can do. It's much easier to hire great developers if you have a fantastic mission. It's much easier to get people to buy into your product if it does good. That's basically it for me today. Thank you very much for listening.